Good afternoon, uh, Rotarians and guests. Uh, my name's uh, Peter Dakin. I'm MC for the day, and it's great to be back uh, here again this week after a wonderful uh, race last week by uh, Professor Jim Angus. And it's uh, really good to see our numbers building up again. Just before uh, uh, we move on, I just, in my role as Club Elman, I'd just like to mention a couple of people I've been in touch with. And I think through the groups, it's really important we keep in touch with our fellow members. Um, Trevor Hill, uh, his wife's had a bad accident and life's pretty tough. His daughter's a young widow, had a stroke, and uh, things are coming good, but I think it's very important we keep in touch with the likes of a long-standing member like Trevor. S spoke with Cynthia Regal, uh, our valued member. She's finally had uh, hip operation. She's uh, recovering in Epworth, bought out of a brain and can't wait to get back to Rotary. Uh, Chris Rod, who'd had heart surgery after uh, collapsing badly some months ago on a bike ride, spoke to him, I said, uh, and where are you? He said, uh, I'm in a bike ride along the Great Ocean Road. So he's come good. Um, but he, he said his regards to everybody today. And Ken Badnock, uh, he's uh, having an angiogram today. So at, at Epworth, and he's been struggling a bit. But I think it's really important that through the groups, we keep in touch with our uh, fellow members and their partners for, for that matter. Okay. So... We would like to acknowledge the Wurundjeri and Bunurong people of the Kulin Nation and also pay our respects to elders past, present and future and extend that respect to all Indigenous Australians present today. Welcome to our hybrid meeting and to those online and in the room, as mentioned earlier. Now, thanks today will be given by past President Robert Fisher, followed by the loyal toast presented by President Reg. Would you please ensure your glass is charged? Over to you. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Peter. We're really fortunate to live in a peaceful country, aren't we? Yet we cannot ignore events that happen elsewhere, as they sometimes have a potential impact on us, or indeed on the next generation. As members of a Rotary Peace Builder Club, we would do well to associate ourselves with this statement, which was issued last week by Rotary International. And I quote, it is a tragic and sad time for the people of Ukraine and the world. At Rotary, we are deeply concerned by the deteriorating situation in Ukraine and the escalating loss of life and humiliation and human humanitarian hardship there. Continued military action against Ukraine will not only devastate the region, but also risk spreading tragic consequences across Europe and the rest of the world. As one of the, the world's largest humanitarian organizations, we have made peace the cornerstone of our global mission. We join the international community in calling for an immediate ceasefire, withdrawal of Russian forces, and a restoration of diplomatic efforts to resolve this conflict through dialogue. In the past decade, Rotary clubs in Ukraine, Russia, and nearby countries have transcended national differences and have actively engaged in peace building projects to promote goodwill and to marshal assistance to the victims of war and violence. Today, our thoughts are with our fellow Rotary members and others in Ukraine coping with these tragic events. Rotary International will do everything in its power to bring aid, support, and peace to the region." Unquote. So for peaceful lives, friendships in Rotary, and the opportunity to serve, we give thanks. Welcome everybody. Thank you, uh, Robert and Peter, Rotarians and guests. A toast to Australia and Rotary International. Australia, Rotary International. Thank you and please be seated.
Uh, for those online, uh, you'll now be invited to join a breakout room uh, where you can enjoy some fellowship uh, with others who are online or alternatively take a lunch break yourselves. We'll be reconvening at around 1.15. And uh, can I just say, uh, if anyone has any problems with the audio, please uh, make your presence felt and let us know and we'll address that. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> uh, thanks, everyone. And uh, uh, I'd like to start by welcoming members, visitors and guests. It's my great pleasure to be to welcome you to our 30th meeting of the year, of this Rotary year, which is uh, our 4,926th uh, club meeting in, 100, in our 101st year. Uh, it is wonderful to see you all here today. And uh, I think we're in for a pretty interesting presentation. I hope, hope you all agree with me when uh, uh, Adam's spoken. Our guest speaker is Adam Jacobi, the founder and chairman of My Vote, which is now a global operation. And in fact, since uh, Adam was telling me, they've, they've moved their headquarters to London now, and they have chapters around the world. So it's quite a, uh, I'm guessing, a growing uh, entity and making an impact. Um, at this stage, though, uh, Adam is uh, he chairs my vote, but he's also um, the director of global and strategic innovation at Swinburne University of Technology. Uh, Adam will be speaking on the ethics in a digital uh, di digital age, and will will be further introduced shortly by our chair of the day, Stephen Rando. Okay. Um, so. I'm just, you may have noticed that the, all of the notices were uh, uh, up on the screen, but many may not have noticed because I think we're all enjoying the opportunity again for fellowship. Um, the uh, uh, three things or four things I want to talk about. One, firstly, uh, next week's meeting, which uh, is a little bit different to our original plan. It was going to be a breakfast. It's now a lunch and Gail Jennings will be our major speaker. She's uh, a uh, well-known science communicator and uh, still working heavily in that field and uh, has a great story to tell us about the challenges of women in science, technology, engineering and mathematics, which is what that term STEM uh, stands for. Um, secondly, I think uh, past President Robert really outlined the rotary response to the situation in Ukraine. Can I just say, we all have networks. Many of us are uh, actively looking at and thinking about what opportunities there might be for a Rotary. Could everyone who has thoughts and ideas or connections that you'd like the club to be aware of so that we can uh, start to sort through the available options for providing support to Ukraine, uh, draw them to uh, mine or Bev Brock's attention coming up to the uh, uh, International Committee <clears throat> and uh, we'll progressively be uh, announcing initiatives uh, based on that. Uh, and just a, a, a personal call to anyone who hasn't been to a district conference, give it some serious thought. I know a lot of Rotary Melbourne members have considered going this year and other things have intruded. Um, and, uh, but uh, it, it is a great opportunity to really have a a good look at some of the diverse things that that happen in Rotary and the amazing stuff that individuals uh, uh, get involved in as champions. And on the way there, you might like to join us in our onto conference experience, which is always a bit of fun amongst uh, this year, a much diminished group than what we normally would have got a few years ago. But again, that's an option. Uh, there's currently about a dozen people enrolled and uh, we're looking forward to having quite a lot, lot of fun together around central Victoria. The final thing that was in the notices was a call for nominations uh, for our uh, uh, this year's Environmental Sustainability Award. That is a very hotly sought after award. Our first one last year had a very large field and uh, uh, we got a fan, an absolutely fantastic candidate who, uh, who won that over a number of other good, good possible choices. But please keep your eye out for people who are doing something in the uh, in environmental space that you'd like to see recognised and that can be put into consideration. 
Gary Fowler and uh, Peter Berg in the Environmental Sustainability Committee would love to hear from you on that. So thank you very much. I'm now going to uh, uh, draw the raffle. For this, this amazing bottle of wine that uh, um, raffle uh, uh, staff for today, Dorothy Nixon has, uh, sorry, Rosemary Nixon uh, has uh, donated. <laughs> Apologies for that, Rosemary. <laughs> and uh, the first thing you need to look at is the colour of your ticket. And we're dealing with an orange ticket and it's... <laughs> That was a bit early, Stephen. <laughs> and, and its number is C98. And Honorary Secretary Russell Board has, uh, I know, a committed red drinker, but this, this will add some quality to your white wine cellar, Robert. Okay, I'm now going to invite Stephen Rando, our um, chair for today, to come to the podium and uh, uh, introduce our friend, uh, Adam Jacoby. Thanks, Stephen. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Stephen Rando. I'm very honoured here to present to you today our guest speaker, Adam Jacoby. Now, just to set the scene for you today, when you believe a system is broken, uh, do you sit back and grumble on it? Just maybe like Mikey or some other systems. Well, Adam didn't. Adam found a way. Adam uh, and his team at my vote uh, are using technology to shake up the state and democracy, which you'll be presenting today, and giving a voice back to the people. As part of that amazing application and business that Adam has made, he's also developed uh, a number of other businesses. Adam, as you've obviously just heard, is the founder and chairman of the global democracy movement, My Vote, and in 2017 and 2019, got the Codex World's Top 50 Innovator, which is absolutely outstanding. Further to that, before he even started that movement, he was actually in the BRWs in 2010 for another organization that he built was the fastest growing company, also called Sportsnet Corporation. So for him to move from one whole sector of a company and then moving to the environment that he has now is absolutely outstanding. Last but not least to add to his listing of achievements was he was actually uh, nominated or the finalist for the Young Australian of the Year uh, for Victoria. So absolutely amazing. Please welcome me um, in his speech today, Ethics in the Digital Age. Um, please, Adam, welcome. Hello all, can you hear me? Is it all right? All of that sounded much more impressive than it really is, I promise you. Um, <coughs> we've got about 20 minutes. Uh, what I'm not gonna do is bamboozle you with conversation about technology in detail today because a lot of the time this conversation gets lost in you know, crypto and blockchain and AI and so forth, but actually the conversation is about ethics. It's not about technology at all. So let's have a conversation about how our ethics are being affected by technology and some of the things we need to pay attention to to ensure that although our world is becoming more digitally connected, our ethics don't flow away with that connection. Are we working? We're gonna click. We're not going to click. We've gone to sleep. Next slide. All right. Before we begin, I'm going to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which we meet today, the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. This is, was, and always will be Indigenous land. Next slide. Okay, the first thing that we need to understand is that we are living in a digital world. And the only constant in a digital world is change. Because every day, in a million different ways and a million different technologies, we are advancing. Every technology company that builds a new product does not build the product, put it in the market and leave it there for three years in the hope that everybody will love it and pick it up. They are constantly evolving the nature of the product, the feature of the product and so forth. So everything that we know is constantly changing. Even the things that we use on a daily basis are constantly changing every day. And so stasis is really not an option for us. Sitting still and assuming everything's gonna be the same is not an option for us. So if everything around us is changing, we need to think about the impacts to the core environment that we live in. Things like ethics, 
things like justice, things like communication, things like relationships. They're all affected by the technology that changes because none of those things are considered as those technologies are designed. Thanks for fixing the clicker, Reg. The first thing that's really critical is technology is neither good nor bad, okay? Technology is just technology. How it is used and how it is designed will determine whether or not it helps us or harms us. Really critical understanding. The technology is just wires. It's just binary code. It doesn't know whether it's good or whether it's bad. Although some of you, some of us would have you believe, certainly people I work with at the university, that quantum AI will soon be able to tell us what we should be thinking. But I still think we're a bit of a way from that point. What we need to understand right now is that we decide whether the technology will be an advancement for us or is going to take us into a, a direction of unintended consequence. And when we understand that, then we understand that we actually have some work to do. There are some questions we need to ask of ourselves when we start to build technology. The first thing we need to understand is the ethics of capability. And the ethics of capability says to us, just because we can build something doesn't mean that we should build something, right? We have a capacity to build more than we've ever been able to build before. But is it going to help us or is it going to harm us? What is the consequence of that expertise, of that advancement? There are a lot of um, experts in technology that I've met in Silicon Valley, that I've met in Israel, that I've met well, all over the world, really, who are genuinely terrified by AI. The reality is AI is here. It's being used by just about every business that you would touch as a consumer every day. But again, there is AI used in ways that help and there is the potential for AI to be used in ways that don't. So again, when we're building things, should we be building them? What are the questions we need to ask? Who is gonna be impacted by those things? And here are a list of questions that I think all technologists and all users need to think about those products. And I'm gonna give you an example in a minute of a product that we all love, but may have gone a little bit askew. But before we get there, let's think about this. These are the questions that technologists need, need to ask themselves, but don't when it comes to the way ethics relates to our technological lives. The first is what is the purpose of this technology? What's, it, what's the first principle? What is it designed to do? Who is designing it? What most of you know is that Silicon, sitting in Silicon Valley, the vast, vast majority, 95 plus percent of designers are young men sitting in rooms with young men. A huge number of them until recently have been white young men, not a lot of diversity. The code that they write and the world that they create for us is based upon their experience and their understanding. But if you don't sit within that subset and you don't share that experience, there's a reasonable chance that, that technology might not fit with you exactly the way that it needs to. So the next thing is what bias and value set do those young men who are creating that technology have? We all have bias. It's ingrained in all of us. As much as we'd like to think we don't, we do. It's just a fact of life. How much we allow that bias to affect the way we behave and engage with others, that's where we all differ a little bit, but we all have it. And so what bias is being built in to the games that we play, to the social um, platforms that we use, to the, the software that gets developed? And then who's going to benefit from it? So if this works and if this platform happens and if this technology is picked up all over the world by hundreds of millions of users, and this is important, no time in history have we had an opportunity, I was just saying this earlier, no time in history have we been able to build a billion dollar business with 100 million customers as quickly as we can today. It used to be, when I was young, you could, you know, to build a billion dollar business would take you 30 years, 40 years. And if you could get offshore and be in another country, that was something special. The idea of having 100 million customers was almost inconceivable. There are startup businesses now with 100 million customers and billion dollar valuations inside their first three months. So when you're able to do that at that pace, not only is it obviously from a capitalist perspective, a great opportunity to create wealth, but if you have your design wrong, if you have not embedded ethical considerations into the way you architect your technology, imagine how much damage it can do and how quickly it can do that damage because you're reaching so many people so quickly. So that question then leads to, well, who's gonna lose out from the technology? Yes, there'll be winners, 
but who are the losers if this technology works? And then what oversight is there? Who's actually making sure that it's not harming people? And if it does harm people, how are they correcting that? Who's responsible for that? Is that a consideration set at the front end or is that something they do afterwards as a user test? So as an example, if you're on a social media platform, <clears throat> we all have our own platforms of choice, Twitter, TikTok, Facebook, whatever. Did they did, were they thinking about the complaints department straight away? Were they thinking about people who might be bullied, might be harassed? Were they thinking about people who are misinformed? Were they thinking about people who are being spammed, has, uh, harassed, hacked? If you're not thinking about those things as you're designing the product, then you're backfilling the challenge. And so this becomes an important consideration. And this is all a bit doom and gloom. I don't want it to feel terrible, all right? Yes, technology has some problems, but we as a, as a tech, technological age need to stop asking the question, what can we build? And we need to start asking the question, what are the possible consequences if we build it? When we start to think about it in a three, from a 360 degree perspective, when we start to think what are the intended and more importantly, unintended consequences of me putting this product into the marketplace, then we have some hope of making sure our products don't harm. If we don't ask the question, it's really just a game of lottery. So let me give you an example. How many people here are on Facebook? How many people use Facebook? Have a Facebook account? Fair few. Personally, I haven't been on Facebook for 12 years. I don't trust them. Nevertheless, it's a pretty big platform, right? The vast majority of the people on the planet have a Facebook account and they use it reasonably regularly. But when Facebook started 18 years ago, Facebook was about Rufus the dog and that Rufus went to the beach. And I took a photo of my dog Rufus and I put it there so that all the people that I went to high school with and primary school with could look at Rufus and go, well done, mate. That looks like a lovely day out. 18 years forward, the unintended consequence of what that platform can do and how it evolved over time is that you have misinformation during an election campaign that tells millions and millions of voters factually incorrect information that have the potential to change an election result. There is no oversight. Nobody checks whether the information is correct. Nobody checks whether people are being misinformed. So the, the social ramification of the capacity of the technology is enormous, but because there were no ethical considerations, there isn't a roadblock to stop it. Now, forget about Trump, doesn't matter what side of politics you're on, the problem is on all sides of politics. The issue is that the technology platform itself is doing something that the original designers did not intend for it to do because they didn't ask the questions about if you put it into the market, what could it possibly do? Who could it possibly affect? How can it possibly be used? And I'll tell you a story about this in a second. I've got a nice little behind the scenes Silicon Valley story for you. So when we look at digital media, social media, a number of you have already come up to me this morning and said uh, that you're excited to learn about it, the, the conversation about social media. Social media is not our friend. Let's be really clear about this. As you all know, if you are not paying for the product, you are the product, right? So we are the product in social media. The fact that we are there, that we have an account and our eyeballs are sitting there and we're spending time on Facebook and Twitter and TikTok means that we are the product that is being sold to advertisers, to data analysts every day. That's how they make money, by us being there, which is why it's free and it's why it's addictive. It's designed to be both of those things. But these are the things that are concerning. There is a question about our security, our cyber security, and whether or not we're getting hacked. Um, there is a mass surveillance consideration about the way data is used and handled. That's a bigger problem than you think it is. Um, they're selling our data every day to people that you don't know. When you sign up to these platforms, many of you will know. How many people, when you sign up to a new digital platform of any kind and you get the user agreement, just press accept without reading the 7,000 pages of user agreement? Everybody does, right? No, nobody's ever opened one of those documents. The reality is that document says that they're able to do pretty much whatever they want with your data at any time. They can monetize it, they can sell it, they can change it, they can amend it, they can give it to anybody they want and there is nothing you can do about it. And in fact, the photos that you take and give to Instagram, Instagram now owns. Think about that. The photos of your kids, your grandkids, your family, your holiday, you don't even own them. 
So the way that our data gets used is a problem. They compromise our privacy. How, how often are you getting spammed by people or trying to sell you things and tell you things that you're not interested in because they see you on the platform? They're not protecting you there either. Um, there is systemic misinformation on every social media platform. What, what ideologues on all sides have figured out is that the accessibility to people who are gullible has never been better and it's never been easier to connect to people who don't research and don't check for themselves. And so the ability to misinform you about things that are happening has never been easier because you see it there in a place where you are all day, every day, and you just assume, assume it's true or somebody that you know and trust liked something or shared something, you didn't choose to research it. You believe it because you trust them and therefore you've been misinformed. Um, there's also manipulation, but I won't get into that. That's more of a political conversation. Um, and then there is the big question. This is the question that's confronting the government and our government at the moment, which is the power of scale. And I'm going to tell you a story about the power of scale in a moment. But these companies are so big and are so wealthy that the question is, how do you actually rein them in? And what do you do with technologies that are richer than countries and have more people than continents? What do you do with those people? What kind of sanctions can you impose on them? Because if they turn their infrastructure off, you've got a lot of disgruntled citizens who don't really want to support that government anymore. So it's kind of a catch-22. So now I'm going to tell you the secret meeting of Silicon Valley. In 2017, I was on a trip to the US for my vote, and I was off to meet a number of people on the east coast of the US. And I was told by a mutual friend, before you get there, stop in in Southern California. I want you to meet Jordan Greenhall. Jordan Greenhall will mean nothing to you because Jordan Greenhall is a relatively secret kind of person. In fact, he's changed his name recently, which I only found out while writing this. Jordan Greenhall is without doubt the smartest person I have ever met anywhere in the world in my life. And I've met some pretty impressive people. He is also incredibly annoying because not only is he brilliant, uh, he's financially successful, very successful businessman, made a billion dollars on his own incredibly good looking, spends most of his day surfing, has a gorgeous family. He's pretty much sickening across the board. He's everything you could imagine that you would want to be. And I went and I met with, with, um, with Jordan and he invited me to his local coffee shop down at the beach where he lives um, around Carlsbad in Southern California. And we sat for about five hours. And this was the very early days of my vote in terms of the technology. And what I said to you earlier about the misinformation and how things are used and how your data is used and sold, this was the first lesson I ever had in that. Because Jordan was there and he said, tell me about this thing. I've heard about what you're building. I've heard about this first blockchain voting platform. And he said, I'm not going to ask you a lot of questions. I just want to hear everything. Tell me how it works, who uses it, how you log on, what you have to do, where the information flows. And he said, because I'm going to think for the next hour like a hacker. And I'm going to tell you every way that I can completely break your system. How I can find a way to manipulate it, distort it, use it to my own benefit, have a nefarious outcome for what you're trying to build for good. So that was a reasonably terrifying start to the conversation. But as the conversation wore on, we ended up walking down the beach and he told me an incredible story that stays to me to this day and I will never forget. And it really goes back to the last slide and the last dot point on that slide where we talk about the, the power of scale. Jordan told me of a story that six months before I was taking that walk with him, the largest technology companies in the world, all out of Silicon Valley, came together in a private meeting. So the Googles, Apple, Microsoft, or Oracle, all the big companies. And they sat down because what they recognized for the first time was actually they were more powerful than any collection of governments. They could reach more people and they had more money than anyone else. And so what they did was they challenged themselves. This is the good part. So it sounds scary at the moment, but it gets good. The good part is they said, yeah, we could probably use that power to enrich ourselves, but let's be honest, we're all pretty rich already. What if we use the power to solve some of the world's greatest problems? What if we came together with more money and more resource and more reach than anyone else to actually look at things like poverty, homelessness, you know, any number of different challenges? And so they set themselves a task and they all, as I understand it, as it was, as it was told to me, set aside a chunk of money in the hundreds of millions each came together and there was now this multi-billion dollar fund that was sitting there. And they chose out of that group of people, somebody to head up the group that could use, reach into any of those tech companies and use the resources and expertise. And they chose a 23 year old from Facebook to do that job. 
23 year old, uh, imagine being chosen to having more money than you could possibly know what to do with and being told, go and fix the biggest problems in the world. This person wasn't trained to do that, had never worked in any kind of social impact space before, you know, was a techie, was a Silicon Valley techie. To, you know, it will surprise no one, it failed. The young man ended up having a nervous breakdown because of the pressure and the weight of expectation of, of him. But the story is important because what it does is it shows us that although the technologies that are being built do have their problems and we do need to make sure that we understand how they're affecting our lives and the kind of questions we need to ask to make sure we build better, more ethical products in the future, the tech companies do recognise that they have a role in making the world a better place. And for an organisation like Rotary, that's really important because that's what you do. That's what you're experts at. It's what you've been doing for over 100 years. You know, the connection fit between you and community and good is known around the world. But what you have are a whole group of technology companies who are saying, we also have other sorts of resource. We have this reach that you don't have. We have cap technological capability and money that you don't have. And so that presents an opportunity to you because there is willingness to be good. What they don't have is an understanding of how to do it. They don't have community impact experience. They don't have reach in to know how to see a project through other than a technology product. So that's you know a positive story. So that takes us to tech and ethics. So as I said, over here, this little champion trophy is where Rotary sits. You are the leaders in community and social impact. You are the champions of that space. But where you see the, the stars are where there are opportunities for you as an organization. The connection between technology and community and technology and social impact are there to be owned. They are opportunities for you to step in and say, we know impact, we know public good, we know service, we know leadership, we know integrity. What we're now going to do is utilize technology to do all of that better, faster, and at a greater scale. And so that's a really exciting opportunity for Rotary. And so when I've thought about this, and this is a conversation I've had with Reg and Bev, um, uh, probably for the last three months now, maybe, I started thinking about, you know, so where, where does it touch? Where does that technology opportunity begin to touch? And first of all, if you look at your value set, Technology can touch across all of it. All of it is still relevant. Your ability to drive ethics into the technology environment is relevant to every one of your core values, all of them. And then the opportunity is around specifically, I think, peace, education, and environment. These are areas where technology has not yet, other than renewables, has not yet had a major impact. No organization has been able to come in and say, we're going to really wrap our arms around this space and do it better than anybody else and be the benchmark for the way technology engages in these areas. And so what could that look like? It could look like a million different things, right? When I think about it, and I lie in bed going, what did Reg say about what, what he's trying to create? I start to think about this. At Swinburne University, we have what is now becoming kind of the, the preeminent leadership index. It's called the Australian Leadership Index. And it, it goes out, it's a research tool and speaks to business leaders all over the country um, and talks about how the general public feels about leadership in the Australian context um, at not-for-profit levels, government, uh, private sector, et cetera, et cetera. I think there's an opportunity for Rotary to consider creating the ethics tech index, the ability to take the 200 largest technology companies in the world and as a research project, whether it's with us or anybody else, doesn't matter. You do it yourselves, probably you have the expertise, probably in this room you have the expertise, to actually start to say, what are the mechanisms, you know, whether it's supply chain, whether those tech companies are using their supply chains, whether it's slavery and child labor, whether it's their carbon footprint, whether it's customer privacy, whether it's cybersecurity, whether they pay their taxes and actually create an index that is able to rate the largest technology companies in the world based upon their ethical footprint in the world and start to change the conversation around technology companies from being the largest and the richest and the fastest to being the most ethical. And we love this company and we use this platform because across all of these critical areas that touch the consumer's lives, they are considerate and they are thoughtful and they are actually doing something to create better products. So I think that that's a conversation that long after I'm gone, you collectively, both here in the Melbourne chapter, but more broadly at Rotary, should really attack. I know that you're very serious about having uh, an impact in the world over the next few years with, I understand there's a big fund. These are the sorts of 
ways that Rotary can leap into the technological age, not leaving behind what its core value sets are, which is ethics and social impact, but actually embracing those things and using technology as an enabler to do them even better. I think that's all I have for you. Thanks a lot. We might uh, just get some questions if uh, you wanted to stand up. Um, well, if there's anybody in the room that understands it, yeah. we'll get some questions. <laughs> That's the first point. Mm. Oh, I've got one of the oldest person. That's good. <laughs> Bruce Davidson. Uh, what a great presentation. We get a lot of good presentations here, but nobody throws down the challenge like you did to Rotary. Thank you. I think that's a, a great thing and uh, we can do something about it. So I, uh, <clears throat> my thing is that I see no ethics in, uh, in the new technology. Uh, everybody uses Google. You search for something specific and you get everything else but what you search for. Yep. Now, there's no ethics in that whatsoever. Yep. So uh, we've got a lot of work to do here. Do you think you can actually change it? Yeah, I, I think you can. I, I don't think it would be easy to do uh, if you were doing it as a startup sitting out of you know, Melbourne on your own. I, I think the thing that Rotary, the reason I think that idea works for Rotary is because your footprint is already so large. And so the ability to start putting pressure on technology companies about the way that they ethically engage and being able to tell that story, to build that narrative in a hundred countries simultaneously, I think is quite powerful. Um, if you try and do it out of here and you're getting the BRW or the Age or the Sydney Morning Herald to write a story, nobody cares, you're gonna have no impact. But if all of a sudden a hundred newspapers around the world are having that story on the same day at the same time, that's a different conversation. So again, like everything, it's how you roll it out, you know? like. That we were saying earlier, startup entrepreneurship, everybody has ideas. Uh, ideas are picked out of the air a million times a day. How you deliver them is whether or not, you know, they're going to be successful. And so, yes, there's opportunity for Rotary, but it has to be well considered. It has to be well planned. It has to be well executed. Um, thanks, Adam, for your talk, uh, Adrian Nelson. Um, the motivation for sort of corporations using technology is ultimately the profit. Mm -hmm. where they get from it or not. And you can look at a whole range of areas, whether it's banks closing their branches because it's a lot cheaper for them to, to just have online mm -hmm. banking. They don't really care about my 85 year old mum and dad who find that really difficult, mm -hmm. whether it's uh, utility companies who only send their bills online. Um, you can really look at, at any area and it's all ultimately the, whether it saves them money or whether it's it's profitable even yep. if you look at the state government when they rolled out all the tech for for the COVID apps and all of that they really didn't look at who's going to miss out or find solutions for going to miss out they're worried about what's sort of for the the greater good and, and didn't worry about the rest so we can talk about ethics for technology but ultimately if it's the profit motive that's driving it all ultimately that's what's going to yeah look to be I, the, the main Oh, there's no questions that business, businesses are not necessarily going to opt into doing things that are not in their best interests, right? But even if you look at Apple as an example, so Apple has dramatically strengthened its cybersecurity uh, capability because its users demanded that they do. Basically, they said, if, we, if there is any chance that we're going to get hacked, we're not going to buy this product. And so what they do now is they come out and they say, we're basically unhackable. You know, we spend so much money on the ability to protect your data that we recognise you think it's important, which is why we're going to do something about it. And so it's one thing, businesses will do what they need to do. But right now, the driver of the business and the driver of that profit is um, it exists in the absence of pressure from the consumer. But when the consumers start to say, we want to see something different or we won't buy your product anymore, it makes a difference. We see it every day. I mean, you're always seeing it. Compared, right to right to say, compared to, say, a bank or many of these large companies, the consumer is so insignificant anyway. There's no... But remember, but remember banks are regulated heavily. But for the most part, technology companies are not. So there's nobody sitting there saying, this is what you have to do. This is how you have to behave. This is how you have to protect consumers. And even if in a nation by nation, jurisdiction by jurisdiction perspective, you can find those elements... How do you prosecute, how does uh, you know, a local city with a particular law or a state 
then prosecute them for breaking the same law somewhere else. They can't, they don't have jurisdiction to do it. They're too big to go after in many instances. It is the consumers who are gonna to have to do that work. You know, one of my favorite sayings, and in fact, I used it in, I just finished writing my first book yesterday after three years. And one of the lines that I used it towards the end, which is one of my favorite sayings, I've used it on stage around the world, is that we are the ones we've been waiting for. You know, I think people attach it to Obama. It came well before Obama. It's actually um, an old Native American um, prophecy. And, and that could not be more true of the change that is needed in technology, because only we, the consumers, can put the pressure on technology companies to make the change for ethics. No, nothing else will change them. If we turn off the platforms, if we stop using them, if we go somewhere else, it will have an impact. We're already seeing it on renewables. We're seeing it in the energy sector. We're seeing banks and investment companies. We're seeing super funds who say we won't now invest in fossil fuels. And lots of people are moving to those super funds. And other super funds are saying, well, geez, maybe we, we need to do something about this. It is the consumer that has the power, but we are often told that we don't. And so we just assume we don't. But really collectively, when we make the decision, we can make any change we want. We just have to decide to do it. Uh, David Cram here. Okay. Uh, this is a general question. Seeing as we expect between 20 and 25,000 Rotarians in Melbourne for the International Convention next year, the last week in May, mm -hmm. might there be a possibility for a forum with yourself and with Noam Harari? Noam Harari, who wrote Say no, I know, he's a big fan. One uh, not only is there, if you can do the other half of that part, I can guarantee my half of that part. So there's a very good chance of that. Yeah. Okay, we've got time for one more quick one. Yeah. Go. David Carruthers, just to say, I thought you let Mark Zuckerberg off very lightly by suggesting that Facebook started with photographs of dogs, when we all know it started as a rating system for females. Yeah, so I, I, th I think that's right. So don't, don't get me wrong. The reason, the reason that I am not on Facebook is I absolutely detest Zuckerberg um, and I don't trust anything he does. So you're right. I mean, what it, but it is worth saying. It is worth, in fairness to the product as opposed to the person, although that is how he started it, the product that was originally launched to the world was the product that we all started using. It's the product that I started using. And the idea was connect with people that you can't be face-to-face -face with every day. Until you, for me anyway, maybe, I'm, maybe I shouldn't say this is not particularly diplomatic. For me, I realised that in fact, I didn't really care about the dog of a guy I went to kindergarten with 19 years ago, who I haven't seen since. And I stopped using it. But, um, but you're right. I mean, and, and I think we do let off technologists lightly. I think Elon Musk in particular is let off very lightly for a lot of the things that he does. Um, his current market manipulation of cryptocurrencies goes pretty much unmentioned in the media. And he knows with one tweet, he can change the market in an instant. It benefits him. Um, and you know, there's not a lot of conversation about that. And so again, we're in an unregulated environment. Um, and the reality is that a lot of these people can get away with stuff. And so they do. And it is, you know, but we, it's beholden on us to hold them accountable again, in the same way that it's beholden on us to hold politicians accountable again, because they're not held to account either. Thank you. We couldn't possibly leave you, you know, with nothing if we are, you know, we can have to do something. So another entrepreneur that we have in the club is uh Bill Hawkins. So we've got your amazing soft in the wear of showcase on your travels internationally. Yeah. We've shown them off on Silicon Valley and thank you very much. Thank you again and uh congratulations. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Adam. Um just again, thank you uh again, Adam and everyone. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Just uh, thank you again, guests, uh, for attending, and thank you again, Adam. Um, I'm few, a few light bulbs, I think, have gone off in this room and some thinking and reflection after. Right. Um, also, thanks to MC, Peter, amazing, thank you, uh, and Robert Fisher and our lunch uh, staff today and set up and receptions, and the rest of the team, um, a fantastic effort in making this meeting happen again, and an amazing guest. Um,
a reminder, if you can just spare a few minutes before leaving the lunch team, appreciate if you can help packing up, anyone that could help, um, greatly appreciated. Uh, for next week, more importantly, uh, a reminder that uh, next week is International Women's Day. Uh, and we have an award-winning broadcaster, Gail Jennings, join us. Um, and a club first um, will be in person, the meeting. So hopefully you can all attend right here at the Sofitel. Um, and I guess speakers will be Zooming in as well for those who can't. Um, just to let you know a little bit about Gail Jennings. She's an Honourable Fellow at the University of Melbourne Centre for Advancing Journalism, where she lends her knowledge to future journalists. Gail's research is uh, on the effect of the internet um, and neurosexualities of the brain and the impact of the new media on women, including social attitudes towards them and violence against them. Gail is most qualified to speak on them and I guess STEM research, which you may have all heard of, but we'll learn all next week and the way of the future. Hope you can join us then. Uh, please stand as we close the meeting for the national anthem. <laughs>